Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, it is a delight to be here. It's also uh, almost a kind of flashback for me. Uh, quite, a, quite a number of years ago, I was involved with organizing and hosting the Moodle Moots in Canada uh, with Francis Long, who I know I saw earlier yesterday. So uh, that was an amazing experience. And I was always really super impressed with Martin as an inspiration from a leadership point of view. And uh, it's fun to come back several years later and see that that's still in place and see such a thriving Moodle Moot community. Um, I'm going to speak today about one of the values that Martin mentioned yesterday that underlies what Moodle's all about, and that is the value of openness. Um, in, in my world, as the executive director of the Open Education Consortia, this is sort of the central focus of the work that I do. And it's a bit like this flower. Um, Openness kind of opens up new possibilities, and it's a bit of a quiet revolution in the education context. And if I think about that flower, the fact that it opens like that is, is the, really the very uh, means by which it propagates its life. It cannot be fertilized by an insect until it actually opens. And, and so I wanted to talk a lot today about why open matters uh, for that flower. Openness matters because that's how its life is propagated. If I actually swap out the word life here and put in education um, and, and say that open is the means by which education is propagated, I think that also has some truth to it. Um, just a quick word about the Open Education Consortia. If, if you haven't heard of us, we're the largest global organization focused on openness in education. We're a members-based organization with members from over 44 countries around the world. Um, most of our members are in higher education, but not exclusively. We have lots of uh, members as well from different organizations, including Moodle, actually. Moodle recently joined us as a member, so thank you for that, Martin. Um, and we're, we're actually planning to expand out our membership to include K-12 corporates and even individuals in the coming months. And there's our website if you want to find out more about us. Um, for us, open education is really about creating an essential shared social good. Uh, we're really focused on the, uh, the notion that education should be accessible to all, and the, and the Open Education Consortia is really about capacity building, enabling collaboration, supporting innovation around open education practices. And so it's actually a really exciting space that we're in, and, and I've been really having a lot of fun in this, in this new capacity. Um, um, Bob mentioned that I, I was involved in, um, in writing a book um, when I was at Creative Commons, and, and here's a, a little snapshot of what that book looks like. It's called Made with Creative Commons. I'm actually going to draw on some of that work in today's talk and share with you some of the insights that we gained around how open business models work, not just in education, but across all sectors. Um, so this is one piece of uh, work that I want to draw on, and then this is another piece of work I want to draw on, which, is, which was really sort of my depiction of what the roadmap for open education looks like. Uh, it's, I, I won't be able to go through all of this roadmap with you today, but this is what I created as a sort of snapshot of what open education looks like across all sectors and where it's going from both a, a where it's growing currently and where it's germinating. Um, and while I won't be able to talk about all of that, I do want to talk about this part of that diagram, what I call the big open. Um, and this refers to all of the different ways in which open is manifesting itself in education. Many of, uh, many of you have been speaking a little bit about, over the last day, open education resources in the context of Moodle. And there's also been, of course, the recognition that Moodle itself is open source software. But in the education space, there are these many different forms of openness. And I thought today it might be useful for me to highlight for you all these different ways to kind of shine this light, if you will, on open education and all the different ways that openness is actually unfolding within the education space. So if I start at the bottom left corner, and I know this might be hard to read from the back, so I'll, I'll kind of quickly go over each of these forms of openness. But it, the, the kind of pink one in the, in the bottom left corner, um, is open source software and open source hardware. There's a lot of that starting to unfold within education. And then above that is open GLAM. Um, and GLAM stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And then there's open science, 
open access, open data, open government, open policy, and open education resources. All of those are taking place inside education right now, this kind of quiet revolution. But they're all kind of siloed from one another mostly, and so I wanted to speak today about all of them and explore with you how there might be some synergies between them all as we start to see them coalesce. Um, on this diagram, there's a little kind of brown line that goes across the, the screen that represents where the ground is. And all of those forms of openness that I just described are, are kind of above the line. Um, and then there's below the line, there's some things that, that I say are germinating. They haven't yet quite come above the ground. And I won't be speaking much about them today, but they include additional open technologies, the use of open data, especially open student data, and the potential for institutions to embrace all of these forms of openness and become a complete open institution and promote and market itself as being so. Um, and along with that comes a whole variety of, of uh, enterprises seeking to support that. Okay, so I want to uh, focus now on each of those forms of openness and just speak uh, with, with you briefly, I'm actually, I snipped a bunch of videos. I thought I'd try this really different technique for this presentation. I hope it works. <laughs> we were working with the AV guys earlier on this, but I snipped a bunch of videos of people talking about each of these different forms of openness. And I want to share some of those videos with you as, uh, to hear, let you hear not just from me, but from other people who are, who are working in this space. But let's start with open source software. Um, and clearly open source software is, is software that the source code is open and, and allows anyone to inspect, modify, and enhance it, and that's really an integral and important part of what Moodle is all about. And I was really, um, you know, this picture of Moodle's uh, adoption around the world that Martin shared yesterday in his keynote, I think is a really amazing example of how openness enables things to be easily adopted to have there be the possibility of rapid dissemination all around the world in a way that cannot be achieved when you're using closed proprietary methods. And so openness enables this kind of easy to adopt, rapid dissemination, very scalable, and also because it's open and people can look at the code and modify the code and get their hands on improving the code, I think it also results in a, a much higher quality product. I'm going to jump now to a few examples from open source hardware. I'm going to start with um, backyard brains. Open source hardware basically refers to the idea that the hardware, and this is hardware that's used in the education context, is designed, the specification for the hardware is, is, is completely licensed in a way that can be studied, modified, and created or distributed by anyone. And here's Greg Gage who's one of the founders of Backyard Brains, talking about uh, why they went with open source hardware, what the, why the openness part matters. The brain is an amazing and complex organ. And while many people are fascinated by the brain, they can't really tell you that much about the properties about how the brain works because we don't teach neuroscience in schools. And one of the reasons why is that the equipment is so complex and so expensive that it's really only done at major universities and large institutions. Uh, so in order to be able to access the brain, you really need to you know, dedicate your life and spend six and a half years as a graduate student, just become a neuroscientist, get access to these tools. And that's a shame because one out of five of us, that's 20% of the entire world will have a neurological disorder. And there are zero cures for these diseases. And so it seems that what we should be doing is sort of reaching back earlier in the education process and sort of teaching students about neuroscience and so that in the future they may be thinking about possibly becoming a brain scientist. And so when I was a graduate student, my lab mate Tim Marzullo and myself decided that, you know, what if we took this complex equipment that we have for studying the brain and made it simple enough and affordable enough that anyone, uh, you know, an amateur or a high school student uh, could learn and actually participate in the discovery of neuroscience. And so we did just that. A few years ago, we started a company called Backyard Brains. We make DIY neuroscience equipment. And uh, I brought some here tonight. And I want to uh, do some demonstration. And so, yeah, I really encourage you to actually watch the demo. This is a TED Talk that, that Greg did. And, and it, the actual demonstrations involve uh, students controlling the arms of different students using these, these uh, hardware systems. It's really quite amazing. Um, 
But when you listen to Greg talk, I mean, one of the things he talks about is uh, the, the Backyard Brains open source hardware approach enables access, it's simple, it's affordable, it's for anyone, whether you're a student or a hobbyist at home. It, it is, in tri is trying to encourage people to participate in the discovery process, and it's also intentionally trying to inspire. And I want to kind of uh, dwell on just uh, the last couple of things here around participate in discovery and inspiration. When I wrote that book with my colleague Sarah Pearson on, on Made with Creative Commons, and we actually did these 24 case studies of organizations around the world, one of the things that really struck us was that the reason these organizations existed, when you speak to the founders, and when you listen to Martin even around why Moodle exists, it's not about maximizing profit and making, making themselves rich. It really has this underlying uh, in other a uh, reason why it exists that, that often taps into these kinds of remarks. Um, here's another one. We actually did, I did do a case study on Arduino. Arduino is another example of an open source hardware uh, device. It was originally created by a group of fellows, um, this is a picture of them actually, <laughs> in, uh, in Italy. Uh, they worked at a school that was for artists and musicians and designers and they wanted to provide a means where they could provide teaching and learning support for people like that who were not engineers but could get them manipulating circuit boards and developing uh, devices that they could actually integrate into their musicianship or their design or their art. And here's Massimo Banzi speaking a little bit about how all that got started. And then this group formed with David Quartier, yes, David Mellis, Tomaigo, and uh, originally at the beginning Gianluca Martino. And one of the things that we did when we designed the first Arduinos was um, we wanted to create a tool that would be cheap, that you could handle yourself if you wanted to, that would be open so that people could, you know, create. Uh, they, they could derive from the design and would make it simple for people to learn about programming microcontrollers and doing electronics the way we do it you know in this in this century one of the advantage of using these small computers these little microcontroller chips is that when I learned electronics you had to build circuits from individual components from resistor capacitor transistors every time you wanted to change the behavior you had to redo the circuit. Well, in this case, you could change the behavior of a device by just changing the code a little bit. And this is a huge step. So when you listen to Massimo, uh, the openness for them equals a, a means for doing something cheaply or affordably. Some, it, lay, it allows people to assemble things themselves. Um, importantly, it allows people to create derivatives. This is actually a really um, important aspect of openness, the fact that you can actually take a copy of the thing and create a different version of it that is yours, that is uh, modifiable by you, something that can be simple, something easy to change. I also put up a logo for the Arduino open source community. Um, one of the things that became apparent when you speak to the founders of Arduino about their whole evolution of their company is that they had a product roadmap for what they were originally trying to do with the Arduino boards. But when more and more people started to engage in the use of Arduino and they built a community around it, one of the significant things that happened was that community completely changed where the roadmap went, not unlike the session yesterday where all of you got to provide input into Moodle's roadmap. And so that took the whole product in a direction that they had never, ever imagined in their wildest dreams and really enriched it over time. I want to move from uh, open source software and open source hardware to open GLAM, GLAM, Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museums. And this is really a fascinating part of uh, what's happening in the world these days when you look at those institutions and the way that they're making their digital heritage works openly available to everyone in the world. And uh, at our, the Open Education Consortium does a global conference once a year, which we did just back um, in spring earlier this year. And we, one of our keynote speakers was Annemies Brokgarden from the Rijksmuseum. And she gave this fantastic presentation. I wish I could show the entire thing to you, but I'm just gonna show a snip. 
But first, I'll tell you about one of the most radical decisions we took on our journey to discovery. And this decision goes a long way to explain Rijksmusie of the Rijks Studio's enormous success. This is a, green, a screenshot of Johan Vermeer's famous painting, The Milkmaid, provided by Google Images. There are a million copies of this image on the internet, in all kinds of variations. So which image corresponds to the real Vermeer? I really need to, I really need to take myself a clear look, and so will most people. Too bad if you are all looking at the wrong image. And in this jungle of images of different sizes and colors, the Rijks Museum wanted to deliver high quality. So we wanted everyone to be using the best image, closest to the original. And the original hangs in the Rijks Museum. So we photographed it. And everyone should be able to use our image. So let's make it as easy as possible. So we decided to give up our business of selling images. No more fees. No more restrictions, no contracts, and no more barriers. All users can download our high-resolution images for free. So use these instead of picking one of the terrible ones. And as the Director of Collections, now the Rijks Museum General Corp Director, explained, the Rijks Museum is a museum which belongs to and is intended for everyone. As we launch Rijks Studio, we are excited to share our extensive collection with art lovers around the world, using the latest digital technology. We created Reich Studio in the belief that the Reich's Museum belongs to everyone. The collection inspires, and we want to unleash the artist in everyone. We started Reich Studio in 2012 by presenting high-resolution images of 220,000 works of art. And the website represented a huge breakthrough in the way art was shown online. It no longer looked like a library catalog. It was all about high-resolution images of objects. Right Studio allows users to see and feel and to collect images, like them and share them with others. In Right Studio, you are the curator. You can create your own selection in your own studio, whether you base it around the color red or around beautiful butterflies. And above all, you can reuse the images in any way you like. Select, use, and do what you want. Use it for the cover of a magazine, or wallpaper your home with it, or restyle your car. Our Rijks Museum is your Rijks Museum. And to celebrate our digital milestone, we asked leading artists, designers, and architects to be Rijks Studio pioneers and to select a work from the collection and use it to create a new work of art. And the first to be shown was a creation by Troog Design. And they created a tattoo inspired by a 17th century flower painting. And these are some more examples. You see the company La Dress, who made a line of dresses. And maybe you've seen I'm wearing one of them. The milk bags that were put on the breakfast table just after the reopening. Or art on Heineken beer bottles. The Heineken Brewery called us and asked politely if they could use our image. Of course we said, all you have to do is download the image and use it. But don't they need to pay? No, of course not, it's free for everyone. And we were very happy that they were so happy with this answer that they decided to become our sponsor. <laughs> I think for them, openness achieves this goal of trying to have high quality representations of their entire collection available out on the web. Uh, one of the things that happened when they made their collection available in that way was that all the Wikipedia articles that relate to the various artists that are featured in their collection, instead of using some sort of crappy image, they started to use the really high quality images from the Rijksmuseum. But also you can see that they're trying to eliminate the barriers that existed in the past to people actually having the opportunity to look at and use their collection. No more fees, no more barriers. Uh, it's really intended to be available for everyone to reuse and make use of and also to build upon and I like that phrase of unleashing the artist in everyone. These kinds of principles that you hear someone like her speak about are what really drives the open movement. Um, in, not so much in, in 
North America, but in Europe, open science is really a big thing. And in some ways, open science is further ahead than, say, open educational resources, which are very popular as a kind of open education movement here. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight the open science is another aspect of the open education movement. And in this open science effort is really focused around taking scientific research and the data associated with scientific research and making that accessible and available to everyone in a way that is open and allows for dissemination and even public access. So uh, let's hear from Nancy Potika around uh, what's driving that and why, why the openness part matters. Open science benefits equally all research stakeholders. First of all, with regards to researchers. Open science increases the visibility of the researcher's profile. Studies have concluded that open access content attracts higher citations than content behind access barriers. In addition, the open provision of research data and lab notebooks increases the active participation of the research community and speeds up the dissemination and conduction of new research. Now, by combining and linking all the research outputs together, researchers can create a complete profile of the work, which is not limited to peer review research publications only, but extends to the rest of the research-related components. That way, researchers can create a strong case not only about the research impact of their work, but also of the societal impact. With regards to the institution, the benefits for the research institutions relate to prestige and the cost savings for conducting research. Um, with regards to the first, institutions that promote a strong open access agenda not only gain the funders' attention, but they can also act as a good example and a lead institution among other institutions that haven't adopted the implementation of an open science strategy. There is also evidence that open science leads to economic benefits. For example, the cost for retrieving existing knowledge is much cheaper than recreating it, while there are reduced costs that relate to staff salaries in terms of data duplication and improvement of collaboration. Funders, on the other side, um, they have benefits because when open science to research procedures and results is applied, they can demonstrate adequately the return on investment and they are also in position to demonstrate the societal impact of the research. Uh, the benefits for the public is that the public gains access to important and useful publicly funded research that can be applied to improve their quality of life. They also enjoy the benefit of being aware on how taxes have been spent and they have a greater awareness of the societal challenges. Okay, so openness in their context, access, participation, reputation for the institution and the researchers, rapid dissemination, cost savings, better return on investment, and societal and economic benefits for all. These are all the reasons why openness matters. Open access is really uh, the focus on making research that is uh, developed and done by faculty in our institutions available digital online free of charge and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. If you haven't seen this little PhD comic, uh, it's really an awesome comic. We're just, I'm just gonna show you a very small piece of it right from the very beginning. Open access is free, immediate, online availability of research articles with full reuse rights. This is about, first of all, making all this content available for anyone, wherever they are in the world, to read and access and build upon so people can do interesting things and work in new ways with the material to really make the research literature much more valuable. Because that's Nick Shockey and his not so <laughs> dynamic voice, but, but the, high, the whole idea here with open access, which is increasingly a requirement now from funders of research, is to ensure that the research that's produced is available to anyone in a free way. It doesn't, it's not behind a paywall. It requires you to pay to access the research. You can reuse it, you can build upon it, and you can do interesting things with it and increase the value of it. If you speak to people who are engaged in open access research, it's all about speeding the rate of uh, knowledge dissemination and, and the creation of new knowledge. 
Open education resources is perhaps the area that I myself have been most involved with and, uh, and is something that has significantly grown in incredible ways in the 15 years that I've been working on it. Uh, I'm really thrilled to see how much open education resources has been supported here in the United States by initiatives like the TACT program, the $2 billion program coming out of the Department of Labor a number of years ago, which invested $2 billion in community colleges creating open education resources, but also initiatives now by the Department of Education in the K-12 space and by others to create open education resources across the entire education spectrum from K-12 to right through to higher education. Um, open education resources really are these education materials that are being developed by teachers and faculty that can be freely used and built upon and shared and disseminated with others. And this is a good friend of mine, Rajiv Zhangiani from uh, Kwantlen College in Vancouver where I live, uh, speaking at the United Nations as part of OpenCon. On, um, on open education resources. He's a very articulate and, and compelling speaker. Again, uh, his talk is awesome. I'll just play um, a small part of it and you can hear from him why open matters. Open education is a philosophy about the ways in which people should produce, share, and build on knowledge. Proponents of open education believe that everyone everywhere should have access to high quality educational experiences and resources, and we work to eliminate barriers to these goals. Whether these barriers are high monetary costs, obsolete or outdated materials, or legal mechanisms, as you saw earlier today, that inhibit collaboration among scholars and educators. Open education can sometimes seem like a radical idea, but it shouldn't especially as we approach the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Heather talked about Article 27. I'm going to talk about Article 26. Some of you will be familiar with this language. Right? Everyone has the right to education, and yet we know that over 265 million children are currently out of school. Education shall be free, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages, and yet 57 million out-of-school children are of primary school age. Technical and professional education shall be generally available, and yet 617 million youth worldwide lack basic literacy and numeracy skills. And of course, higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit, and yet by 2025, tertiary education institutions worldwide will need to accommodate up to 100 million additional seats. The truth is that the only reason that open education still sounds radical is because of how far reality is from these goals. I would suggest that what is really radical is our tolerance for failure in delivering on a universal right to education. That is why it's so important that the Sustainable Development Goals explicitly include a focus on quality education. Having these specific targets for 2030 helps, as does recognizing the central role that education plays in making progress towards all of the other SDGs. Think about breaking the cycle of poverty, progress towards gender equality, responsible consumption and production, and reduced inequalities. That's a recurring theme today. But on that note, it's important to acknowledge, as SDG 4 does, that an education that is not inclusive, an education that is not equitable, really only serves to reinforce and replicate existing power hierarchies. One incredibly powerful tool that is being effectively deployed right now worldwide in service of SDG 4 is Open Educational Resources, or OER. OER are teaching and learning resources that are published with an open license. These can include textbooks, instructional videos, interactive simulations, lesson plans, and much, much more. Publication with an open license means that the copyright holders are choosing to permit others to freely reuse their work for any purpose, to retain their work forever, doesn't evaporate, and even to redistribute their work to others. But it's more than that. They're also choosing to permit others to build upon their work by adapting it for the local context, for example, by translating it into a regional language. For example, in Senegal, which is one of the fastest growing markets for self-paced online education, the project CSD is translating and adapting STEM OER to fit local needs. Open licensing also often permits others to, to earn a livelihood based on their work by building and selling services around the resources in the process spurring economic growth. Yeah, goes on and on, but I think 
Uh, Rajiv makes a compelling case for open education resources generating some uh, significant benefits around access to education worldwide, around uh, eliminating barriers having to do with money and legal issues, around the way that they are inclusive, around the options that they provide for free use, for retention, for redistribution, the way that they can be built upon, and the way that they can enable people to earn a livelihood. All of these things are why open matters in the context of open education resources. There are a few other areas of open in education that I just want to touch on briefly. I'm not going to show video clips associated with these, but I wanted you to hear diverse voices talking about open education, not just Paul Stacy talking about it. Um, open data is data that is uh, freely available for anyone to use and republish as they with, wish without restrictions from copyright, patents, or other mechanisms of control. I will say that in the open education space, open data is emerging as a little bit of a controversial topic. And you can see from the slide of Chris Gilliard that openness is starting to be thought of as, a, as a, uh, something that might enable our ability to be free from surveillance, from extraction, and from monetization of data. Um, even in the context of learning analytics and the way that those are baked into various tools and technologies, there's a lot of questioning going around the open education movement and community around who owns that data and when terms and conditions require students to turn over the use of that data for various purposes that don't necessarily serve their needs. Uh, there's a lot of questioning around whether that's something that's okay. So the, the focus in the open space in terms of open data has been around data that is, un, that is learner owned, controlled by the learner, and if it's to be used by others, it should be used for only two purposes. One would be to improve the quality of their learning experiences, and the other would be to help them achieve learning goals. Um, it's worth mentioning that there is a global effort around openness in government. It's called the Open Government Partnership. Uh, your country is a participant, my country is a participant, as are many, many other countries around the world. And the Open Government Partnership is all around promoting democracy, improving governments, governance, and renewing trust. Uh, one of the things that's become interesting with the Open Government Partnership is that open education is being integrated into the platforms and action plans of governments around the world as they try to show how they are supporting openness to achieve these kinds of goals. And so, uh, so for them, it's kind of like um, trying to show that there, there really is a high value to open education and that it supports that kind of agenda. agenda. Associated with that too is uh, what I'll call open policy, which can exist at the government level or at an institution level, and really is around supporting the openness of education through policy. A lot of what happened in open education happened from the grassroots level, uh, but of course to really make it sing and to see it flourish, you need top-down support meeting bottom-up support, and policy is that means by which that can happen to achieve the full benefits of openness. And one of the other driving forces of policy around this has been the notion that when the public funds something, whether it's research or education, the public ought to have access to what it has paid for. I think that's actually an argument that most taxpayers would agree with. Um, here's a few examples of how open policy is playing out in the education space. Uh, policy approaches to education uh, coming out of the European Union, a great uh, OER state policy playbook from uh, Spark here in the United States, and also I was just recently at the Open Education Policy Forum, which took place in Warsaw and Poland, that gathered together those of us that are engaged in formulating policy on behalf or in support of governments and trying to coordinate what does the optimal policy look like. Uh, one of the exciting things from my point of view is that here are all these myriad ways of being open in education. How can we combine them? Um, and we had a keynote speaker at uh, OE Global in Delft in the Netherlands, Aaron McKeeran from Mexico, who talked a lot about 
how she, her work as a faculty member is combining the use of open education resources to do actual scientific experiments which generate open data using tools like Backyard Brains and others to, to kind of, uh, that are open source and then actually publishing the results of that kind of work in an open access way. So there's, this, there's sort of an interrelationship between all of these different forms of openness that I think has some exciting potential. Okay, so, so that's the big open, the kind of tree on the left. I've kind of quickly done a very sort of skim surface survey of all of those forms of openness and how they are playing out in education. And many of you may be aware of, of one of those, but I hope uh, with my talk this morning, I've kind of raised your awareness of all of those forms in, in education that are flourishing and starting to take root because of the openness part of how they work. I'm going to switch now then to talk about this, which is really related to the sustainability question that was brought up yesterday several times around when we're open like this, how do we sustain ourselves? This is the driving question that led us to write this book, my colleague Sarah Pearson and I. I I've done work with Creative Commons for many, many years, and, and probably you may have this question in your mind, or if you, you are a supporter of openness, you may be dealing with faculty who have this question, which is, why would I take work that, I, uh, that I've created and share it to, for others for free for them to use uh, when that's the basis of my livelihood? How will I continue to earn a living? How can I keep the lights on? And, uh, we, and yet we know from all those examples that I just went through within the open education space that it's happening a lot. And so how does it work? from an economics point of view. And that's what drove us to look at, uh, we actually did a Kickstarter campaign, raised a bunch of money from over 1,600 backers to write 24 case studies and then develop a big kind of macro framework that provided some guidance and strategy for others who are looking to, to move in this direction that allowed them to understand how it made sense from an economic and social aspect. And, and part of that related to how a commons works, which I'll come back to in a moment. Oh, I should say, by the way, the book is available for free at this URL. It's openly licensed. You can download it. You can reuse it. It's available in EPUB and PDF and all kinds of and editable formats as well. Um, here are the 24 organizations that we did a case study on from around the world. As I mentioned earlier, they're not all from the education space. They're from across all sectors. So uh, our, you see Arduino up in the top left, but Blender, for example, is like software for doing 3D uh, animation movies. The Rijksmuseum, uh, you saw a little video clip on. Siavula does open textbooks in South Africa. Open Desk is a furniture maker. Cards Against Community, some of you may have played. They're actually openly licensed. Knowledge Unlatched is a consortium of libraries working together to, to uh, openly license books from publishers, and so on. Uh, music platforms. Uh, open textbooks, Wikimedia or Wikipedia itself, Amanda Palmer, a very uh, popular musician here in, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, we actually interviewed all of the founders and uh, people involved in these um, organizations. And what we were looking to talk to them about is, how did you get started? What do you do? Why do you make the things that you do open to everyone else? And when you make them open and freely available like that, like how do you earn a living? How are you sustaining yourselves? What's the means by which you're continuing your operations? What open license do you do? And also, what's your motivation? What drives you? I won't go into each of those case studies, but instead I thought I'd provide some sort of high-level summary of some of the key takeaways from our uh, 24 case studies, the sort of macro part of the book, and if you want to read about the case studies, go ahead and download a copy. Uh, one thing that became apparent is that open and open business models is not business as usual. It's sort of open is like business unusual. It's unusual in that it's not about maximizing profit and getting rich. It's not about restricting access, it's about maximizing access. Normally for most businesses and organizations, you know, you have an asset, and if someone else wants that, they have to pay you first. So there's restricted access to that asset. But in the open space, the asset is actually made available freely to everyone immediately. You get value first, and then a, a means of providing support reciprocally is, 
is sought or put in place. It's not about monetization of commodities, it's not about extraction and consumption and selling to the highest bidder, nor is it solely about the bottom line, but clearly all these organizations have to, have to pay some attention to that. So, open is business unusual. It's also driven by social good. Virtually every one of the case studies that we interviewed had as a mission and vision, the similar kinds of missions and visions to what you heard from Moodle yesterday, that there's an aspiration to make the world a better place in some significant way. And so, as part of that, they have open assets that they're making it available. They're driven by making the world a better place in some way. And they also have a very different kind of perspective of how to relate and engage with people their users, their customers. It's not about a transaction, right? I have this thing, you give me some money, I give it to you. It's not that at all. It's really more about an interaction. It's about personal connection. They actually want to know and engage with you personally. They want to collaborate with you and form a community with you around the open things that they're making available. It's sort of based on human connection as opposed to just a straight, anonymous transaction. A very different kind of view of how to work with their customers. However, <laughs> I, I'll say a couple more things. Uh, one is, well, I should say this first. I'm going to say that there's a large, diverse range of business models. There is no one business model that works for everybody. And I've listed a, a, a number of them here. Uh, and we see a lot of the support and uh, partners for Moodle also doing this kind of thing, right? A value-add custom service built on top of Moodle. Uh, but also many of the other examples in our case study work, you know, you have the digital thing is free, but if you want a physical copy of it, so, you know, the Arduino circuit board design is free, but if you want the Arduino actual electric circuit board, that's a physical good you're going to pay some money and some of that money will go to support the company. Uh, or maybe digital is free but in person if you're Amanda Palmer you're giving away your music for free but if you want to see Amanda Palmer perform you're going to pay. Um, or perhaps uh, like we did to create this book maybe you're raising money up front and people are investing in the creation of something that doesn't even exist yet or if you've uh, looked at Patreon, you know, there's a means by which people are actually supporting organizations and artists on a monthly basis. Here's some money I give to you every month, and, and in return, that artist or that organization commits to uh, produce something every month. Or perhaps there's a one-time full-cost recovery payment, and then after that payment's been made, the thing is completely open. There's many, many different models. These are just a few, uh, but I would say that they all have this component of reciprocity to them, and I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that. Um, and then, but typically, because I wrote this book and, and there's lots of people trying to figure out open business models, I get asked, well, just, like, just tell, me, tell me what I should do. And so I, I decided I would create a bit of a mathematical formula, which you see up here in yellow, to emphasize a kind of generalized approach to how to be successful with this kind of open business model or open means of operating. And the, the, the mathematical formula goes like this. First, you have something you're gonna make open. And the higher the value proposition of that thing that you're making open, the more likelihood you'll have of success. So if you take some crappy thing and make it open that nobody cares about, um, you're not gonna engage very many people in using it. So the higher the value proposition of the thing you're making open, the better off you are. Have a social good that you're trying to accomplish. What is the way that you're trying to make the world a better place? And then around that purpose, around that mission and vision, and around that highly valuable resource, build a community. Allow that community to use it. Allow that community to enhance it, contribute it, contribute to it, etc. And if you do those three things, that's kind of your upfront investment, those three things are the basis on which you can then have the potential to earn some revenue. It's a little bit different than the kind of traditional approach. Um, if you want to see a summary table of all the 24 case studies from a business model perspective, here's a URL. I put together one table that looks at 
where they are in the world, who they are, what they do, what open license they use, what motivates them, and how they sustain their operations, what's their business model. Um, I also want to emphasize that openness, and this is actually something that's not happening all that much in education right now, and I really, really hope as we move forward that it does, that really openness involves a change to fully realize the benefit of openness, to, to accept it as an innovation, you have to kind of look at and examine how it impacts everything across your whole value chain. If this is like a diagram that represents typical business operations, you get R&D on the left, then you have manufacturing assembly, then you have sales and business development, then you have distribution and delivery, and then you have warranty and customer support. That's sort of your traditional sort of business operations approach and where your cost centers are. If you really want to make the most out of open and you're trying to innovate, including in education, you need to look at every way, every step of your value chain and how openness affects it. We haven't actually done that yet in education very well. How does openness affect the way we recruit students, the way we enroll them, the way we provide student service support for them, the way the library works? We haven't really done that yet. Openness is still kind of percolating away in little kind of areas across, across schools and institutions, but we need to do this. And I want to give you an example of what happens when you do this. So the example I'm going to use is Open Desk. Um, open Desk makes furniture. So I know this isn't education, but I want to use it just as like a, an example that hopefully kind of stimulates your own thinking around how this might work in education. So obviously in a typical furniture process, right, there'd be, you know, you'd have your R&D department that would come up with a design for furniture, then you'd have your factory where the furniture would be manufactured, you'd have some sort of sales and marketing happening out in furniture stores around around the region or around the world. Then you'd have a warehouse full of furniture uh, that would ship, be shipped to wherever a sale took place, and then usually the furniture manufacturer is providing some sort of support. Open Desk approached it entirely differently. They have no in-house R&D set of designers. They outsourced the design for furniture to a set of global designers from around the world. And then they curated what they felt were the best designs that they would make available on their platform. So they don't do R&D themselves, they outsource it to the global community who agrees to openly license their design and allow it to be used within the open desk, desk context. They have no factory. They don't make the furniture themselves. They match make you to a local maker in your region or your community. So if I'm in Vancouver and I want a coffee table that I like on the Open Desk website, and I say to Open Desk, I want that coffee table, they'll match make me to a local maker in Vancouver who will actually make that piece of furniture for me. Cut it out, assemble it, provide it to me. So they have no factory. The platform is the means by which they're doing sales and development. It's kind of a matchmaking process between the design and the designer of the furniture and the, and the maker of the furniture. They have no warehouse. There's no, they're not making tons of furniture and storing it in a warehouse and then shipping it. And the actual support for customers is kind of a partnership between Open Desk and the maker. So for them, uh, their whole examination of openness across all these business processes led to a greener means of producing furniture, less costly means of producing furniture, more sustainable from the environment perspective, a kind of personalized way of manufacturing furniture because every, you know, if I look at that coffee table and I want a slightly bigger one, because the coffee table design is openly licensed, I can actually change the design and create a slightly bigger table and have that made. And also, um, one of the delightful things about their work, which I found really fascinating, was that all of their customers tend to have uh, this uh, enthusiasm for the open desk furniture because it has a story. They know the provenance of the furniture. If I get that coffee table and you come and visit me, I can say, this coffee table was designed by so-and-so from such and such a place in the world. I had it made by such and such a place just around the corner. It has a story. You know the provenance of that furniture. Whereas this furniture that I'm seeing in front of me, I have no idea. I have no idea who made any of that. So all, all this to say that it's really important to consider how openness impacts all of the all of the value chain associated with your 
your, uh, your education organization or the business you're trying to create. Um, and the last couple of things that I want to say. Um, from a macro point of view, when I engage in conversation with people around this topic, in general, what I hear are there are two ways of doing things in the world. Two ways of, I was just at the Hewlett Foundation and the president was saying there's two ways to scale things in the world. Through the market, through the state. Those are the only two ways. And I'm sitting there going, that doesn't quite sound right to me because I know there's this third thing called the commons. And anything that is open is essentially something that's part of the commons. And the commons has a long history, but the commons is an incredible means by which we have seen examples already of how things can be rapidly disseminated, how they can scale, how can they spread around the world, how they can remove barriers, how they can level the playing field. So there really are these three ways of doing things, not two. We don't hear politicians talking much about the commons, especially not in the North America context, but in the European context, there's quite a bit more talk about it, especially in places like Barcelona. If we were to think back, though, historically, if you go back to the days of Robin Hood in the United Kingdom, in Britain, you know, the commons and the people who lived on the, on the land shared the forest, shared the pastures, shared the waters as a commons. They all collectively were allowed to use those resources and collectively managed them. But if, and so, really, the commons was the principal way by which we managed resources by which we survived as a society. Sure, there may have been a tiny little market, and obviously there was a, a king <laughs> who represented the state, but the commons was the, by far the dominant force. Uh, but then we had, even with the story of Robin Hood, the appropriation of the commons by the state. Basically, the king takes over everything, the forests are now his, the water is his, the deer are his, the commoners are evicted, you can no longer use these things that led to the whole kind of Robin Hood story. Um, and you have people who become dispossessed from things that they used to have access to and the commons starts to shrink and the market starts to grow. And this is really kind of what it looks like today. You know, the market has become the dominant means by which we develop and share resources um, and this state is still supporting things depending upon your political view. They should do more or less in terms of free markets or not free markets. The commons is basically this tiny little thing that hardly ever gets talked about. But in the open context, the commons is actually a really central concept. And I want to just talk to you briefly around how we framed it in the uh, Made with Creative Commons book. This is the part that I wrote about, so <laughs> this, you get some of my passion here. Um, Wikipedia could be thought of as almost, almost a pure commons play, right? It doesn't rely on state funding. It's not a market play. Really, the whole Wikipedia initiative is funded through personal donations that people make every year to support the Wikipedia initiative grassroots people like you and me who might pay five bucks or whatever you end up donating to Wikipedia to continue to do what they do. That's kind of a commons-like approach, but others, let's say Arduino, are what I call hybrids. They're partly about the commons in that they're sharing the designs of their hardware circuit boards and allowing people to modify them and reuse them and create derivatives and so on, but they also are operating a part of their organization as a market traditional business. They have sales, they have trademarks, they have a means by which they're earning revenue. So you have this kind of market commons hybrid and to be successful in that capacity you have to know how do I successfully run the part of my organization that is all about the commons as a commons and then how do I continue to do things that are of the market as a market. If a lot of the failures in the open education and open space that I see have to do with use of market-based approaches for the commons work. And that tends to alienate the entire open commons community and create adversarial relationships, of which there are a lot right now happening between the open education movement and community and, say, publishers. Um, Something like the Rijksmuseum is what I would say a market commons state hybrid. 
in this case, the state is the, you know, the, the Netherlands, the country of the Netherlands and taxpayers' money is funding the Rijksmuseum itself, but the Rijksmuseum has chosen to make hundreds of thousands of images available freely and openly uh, to the public, to everyone around the world to use for any purpose they want. And that's very much a commons component of what the Rijksmuseum does. And then they have a little tiny market part which has to do with if you, if you actually visit the Rijksmuseum, you have to pay to get in. So they're still generating some revenue through attendance. And by the way, when the Rijksmuseum decided to openly license their entire collection and put it out as high quality, really high res images to everyone around the world, they were really worried that no one would come to the Rijksmuseum anymore. But in fact, just the opposite happened. By making their collection visible to everyone around the world, it really drove a lot of interest for people to go to the Rijksmuseum and see the works in person, for real. Because, of course, seeing an image of something is nowhere near as impactful as seeing it in person. And so the attendance at the Rijksmuseum is just like skyrocketed since they did that. Um, I'll also say that uh, one of the things we uh, found was that openness is driven by a set of principles. And these are some of the principles that I think should be driving how we participate in the openness activities add value. The, so let me say it this way, specifically within the Moodle context. Okay, so Moodle's free, it's open, um, but even if you are not able to contribute to the code base or pay money directly to Moodle for specific things, try to contribute back. Re, try to provide some reciprocal value to Moodle back in some way. Add value to what they're doing because that's that add, add value by the community part is one of the ways that they build up greater and greater capability, greater and greater functionality. Give more than you take. Be transparent about what you're using from the commons, what you're adding to those resources from the commons, and what you're monetizing. Give a lot of attribution and gratitude. This is like, it seems like such a basic thing that you would say thank you, but it hardly ever happens. And of course, in the market context, we don't have any expectations that there'll be any thanks. But in the commons, attribution and gratitude and, uh, and thankfulness goes a long way. Develop trust, defend the commons. It's kind of about uh, sharing and a set of principles. It's also openness in the commons is a set of social norms and behaviors. It's a social system. There's the commons is typically thought of as the set of resources, but then there's the, the act of commoning, which is an actual thing that we do when we're sharing. And that thing involves behaviors and norms associated with those behaviors. This is actually an area that has been um, not well paid attention to what the norms and behaviors should be for acting in the open space. And so uh, for the open education resource side of things, I wrote uh, recently actually um, a common strategy for successful and sustainable open education that lists 15 behaviors. It describes detrimental behavior, then it describes positive first steps in terms of how you can engage in behavior that's more positive, and then looks at um, how to be more invested and even what optimal behavior might look like. And if you're interested in any of that, um, there's a URL for seeing it. So open is this kind of shift from these kinds of practices, which are typical of the market, to these kinds of practices, right? So we're going from scarcity to abundance. This is actually an interesting notion that with digital works, they can be infinitely abundant. You know, if I give you a copy, I still have a version of it. It could be infinitely, I can give everyone a copy, no problem. We can all have a copy. There's a potential for infinite abundance. And yet, we tend to treat digital things as like physical things. And we create artificial scarcity that restricts the dissemination and distribution and use of those things. Openness is very much a means of changing that trying to move towards abundance, trying to move from exclusion to inclusion, available to everyone all around the world, trying to move from impersonal to personal, from extractive to additive, from commodity to shared use and reuse, from consumption to co-creation, from monetization to value creation beyond dollars. Openness can involve not just money, 
but value creation that is a commitment of time or the development of a, a, a resource that you're sharing with people that doesn't have to be about money. Instead of about maximizing profit, it's about economic efficiency. And instead of unlimited growth, it's really about sustainability. Okay, so I've been making an argument for why open matters. Um, in my view, openness is kind of popping up in education across the board, really across all dimensions of openness. And part of our role, part of our function, and the way we can help enable openness in education is by supporting each of these forms of openness. Add some water and some sunshine to them. That's what makes them thrive. And that's what will help open education continue to grow and have a significant impact on all of our work, both here in the US and around the world. Last couple of comments from me, and then I'll just stop. I want to give attributions. So I used a lot of video images and a lot of pictures and snips uh, from various things. And as I was saying, I like to give gratitude and thanks for those who created them. So here's a slide that gives some gratitude and, and identifies the sources for those things. Um, if you're interested in open education, um, uh, my organization, the Open Education Consortia, runs and supports something called Open Education Week. It happens every year. Um, this coming year, in 2019, it will be March 4th and through the 8th. We have a website where people can upload events that they're hosting either in their um, community or online that others can participate in and attend and share resources and recordings that everyone can also benefit from. So it's acting as a, a week-long event for awareness raising and advocacy for open education. And we also do an annual global conference. Uh, last spring it was in Delft. We're moving it to the latter part of the year and so next year it will be in Milan in November. Um, and if you're interested in open education, uh, please come. This actually is the biggest event that focuses on open education globally. There are other events around open education that focus on open education regionally, here in the US and North America and here in Europe, or, or in Europe. But this one is uh, very much open education from a global perspective. So that's it for me. This is, uh, this is actually a picture from my apartment. I live in Vancouver. There's the mountains, the snow. Um, and an interesting mural that's just outside my window. And how to get a hold of me. If you'd like to speak to me more or connect with me, please do. Um, look forward to continuing to participate in the Moodle Moot um, conference today and continuing to be an active participant in the Moodle Moot community. So thanks very much for having me.